In the past, I've used my 3D printer to augment my builds and add small details or diorama accessories, but I've never really committed to using large 3D components in any of my builds. This Stuart and these two figures are entirely 3D printed in 148 scale, and in this video, I'm going to show you how I did it. I'm James, and you're watching LPJ Models. First up, let's take a look at where I got the files. The 148 Stuart is available for free on soyuyo.main.jp. Junpai Temma, the blog's creator, has a wide variety of projects on his site, and his blog is a testament to his hard work and excellent skills. And very kindly, he's provided some STLs free for the community to use, including this Type 97 Chiha, some conversions and extra details, and of course, the main focus on this build, the M5A1 Stuart although pretty much most versions of the Stuart are available to download on this site. To find them, you just need to navigate to the Stuart page and hit the 3D Yes Road Link button, and that takes you to a directory of downloadable parts. To download the parts properly, just hit the DL text to the right of the title of the part. Junpei seems to have spent a lot of time meticulously recreating the Stuart, and the detail on the screen looks absolutely fantastic. Once you've downloaded your files, you can open them up in Fusion 360, where the files were created. And to make things easier to print, you can toggle different components on or off, and you can export each individual component as separate STLs, before moving these to your slicer software for supporting, orientating, and printing. To select and deselect these parts, what you need to do is head over to the Browser tab at the top left. Here in the Open menu or under the Bodies tab, you'll find different named components that you can toggle on or off. There are some features that are off by default. For example, the sloped side armor that protects the 50 cal. For my build, I chose to keep the majority of the hull and turret intact while separating some of the extra fine details that might be more tricky to print. And this system, instead of it being one complete solid model, makes it a lot easier to print. For example, if I wanted to open the hatches on this tank, it was completely possible. All I have to do is separate the turret hatch that I want open, isolate it, export it to my slicer of choice, and orientate it and support it as you would normally. By the way, the build bit is coming up really soon. If you want to fast forward to the build, just skip forward around a minute. Some parts, helpfully, are supplied as pre-supported Fusion 3D files that are really easy to export into an STL format. Alongside the parts that I supported, I used these pre-supported files as well. So overall, I'm really impressed with these files supplied for free by Junpai Temma. There will be a link in the video description if you want to find them yourself. The two figures I chose were supplied by 3D Art or 3Dart on Cults 3D. These two 101st Airborne figures were advertised as 1 16th or 1 35th scale figures, but I just scaled them down to 148. The sculpts and details on these are really nice. That's why I went for them. Right, that's enough preamble. Let's get on with the build. Being 3D printed parts, there are a fair few supports to remove before the parts will be ready for assembly. A quick note, the parts were printed on both my Elegoo Saturn IV Ultra and my Anycubic M7 Pro. As you can see here, the parts came out really crisp with barely any layer lines. I used a mixture of small and large supports, using large supports for weight bearing structures and fine supports for areas where I wanted to preserve detail or just add a little bit extra structure to the print. These supports were all trimmed away with my god hand, <coughs> shouldn't really be using these, single blade sprue cutters. And once all these annoying scaffolding pieces were removed, any texture was then sanded away. I used a variety of sanding grades from coarse to fine. Coarse to get rid of any major lumps and bumps and fine to blend the surface in so it's nice and smooth. There was one print floor on the main hull of the tank and that was on the port side vertical superstructure. This needed a little bit of sanding and a little bit of surfacer just to fill in some tiny dents. I also sanded away a small amount of raised detail, but this was replaced with lead wire. This is pretty much the most cleanup I had to do on the entire build. 
that's not bad going. So it's time to put the tank together. And there weren't really tons of parts, which is fine by me. I used a variety of VMS super glues for this. VMS Black Flexi 5K CA got used a fair bit so I could see if there was any excess I needed to clean away. And if I did get anywhere it wasn't needed, a touch of debonder and a few minutes and the parts were clean enough for painting. Anyway, I started the build with all the details on the lower hull. Starting with the rear vents and tow hooks, before popping the gun and the mantlet onto the turret, I printed the main gun, MG and mantlet in one piece. As you can see by how this fit, the tolerances were really good. The trickiest part of the build were the light guards on the front plate. I don't think I removed these from the supports at the right angle, so they did need an extra bit of glue to go down. But I got there in the end. Some of the pre-supported parts were trickier to remove because they had a large flat plate and some chunky dividers separating the parts. While protecting them from damage, it did make this stage a little bit tricky. But with some persistence and my trusty razor saw, I got there in the end. As you can see, this is a pretty dusty process. So apart from taking the correct precautions to protect yourself, it's a good idea to dust down your workbench after every few steps. Because apart from the risk of getting dust in your paint, your workbench will also start to look like Tony Montana's desk. Some of the parts, like the rear of the suspension arms, needed a little bit of teasing to get into place. But overall, it wasn't a tricky job. I also printed some stowage and added this to the rear of the vehicle along with the tools. The only parts of this build that weren't 3D printed were the tarps and fabric items on the back of the tank. To make these, I simply used some cheap lined paper and some VMS paper shaper. The best way to use this is to put some in a small pot and dip the paper. But for some reason, when I was making this tarp, I was obviously feeling particularly lazy and just went with the messy approach. Paper Shaper is a really cool product. It softens the paper enough for you to be able to fold it into the shapes you want without the paper becoming too soggy and tearing. While you do still need to be careful, it does allow for some really natural looking folds and drapes. For this particular tarp, I wanted some of the stowage on show and some of it covered up. So it was folded around my pre-glued 3D printed stowage and dropped into the place where I wanted it to sit on the tank. It was then carefully brushed, shaped and manipulated until I was happy with the end result. It's a pretty straightforward process. The main investments are time and patience, but being scale modelers we should be familiar with those concepts. For the most part, anyway. I know I sometimes have problems with patience. Using an old brush, I pressed the tarp in and around the details to make it look like naturally sagged and weighted fabric. On the left side of the tarp, I introduced some natural looking folds, as if the corner had just been chucked down into place. So that's pretty much the construction of the tank complete. I did leave the bogey wheels and one piece tracks off to make them easier to paint. But I must say, I'm impressed with how this tank has turned out. I think it looks really cool. Should we paint it? First up on the painting stage, of course, was some primer. Instead of using black to preserve the green tones of the olive drab, I'm priming the model with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Mahogany Brown. I built this up with a few light coats, sprayed fairly wet making sure to get the primer into any crevices and hard to reach areas. Oddly, on the lower sides of the hull, behind the wheels, I needed some extra layers of primer because there were some very slight layer lines visible, but this wasn't too drastic. And as I don't build a lot of US armor, I didn't have a decent olive drab, so I mixed my own. From AK Real Color mixed with MLT, I used two German colors, Dunkel Brown RAL 7017 and Feldgrau RAL 6006, about 30% brown to 70% green. This made a nice mucky olive green. And this was applied in several even coats over the entire tank. 
building the colour gently up to opacity. There's a lot of variants in olive drab colours, but I wanted to go for a nice dark one. I think the dark olive drabs make the tank look a bit heavier. For the next step, I mixed up a one-to-one -one mix of black and dark brown, and then mixed this in, again, at a one-to-one -one ratio, to my olive drab mix. This was then heavily thinned, around 80% thinner, and used to post shade around the details and any dark areas on the tank. This was ultra subtle, and because of that, it's quite hard to see on the footage. But when I angle the tank, you can see it a bit better. Anyway, this effect was built up over the whole vehicle. Just to add the elements of a shaded finish. I'll follow up with some highlights in a mo. And this is the completed shading effect. Pretty subtle, right? Hopefully I don't lose it as I move on with the paintwork. To lighten my olive drab, I mixed in some Gel Brown RAL8000 and some Growl RAL7027, just a few drops of each to lighten the green. I then mottled on some subtle highlights. This is to add some more visual interest and a bit more punch to the finish. Think of this as a really subtle modulation. As you can see, the lighter shade is a little less subtle than the shadow shade. Let's continue this on the rest of the tank. On the larger surfaces, I'm using a more mottled method of application. This is just to keep it looking natural. And this is the finished shaded and highlighted tank. To keep it simple, I just went for three shades, shadow, mid-tone and the highlight. And it looks pretty good. One of the big flaws of downloading models to 3D print is that they don't come with decals. Luckily, many years ago, I built lots of 148 Hobby Boss Shermans, so I did have some spare decals in the stash. They are really old, so hopefully they go down nicely. As usual, I'm decaling straight onto paint and using VMS Decal Set and Fix just to boost the adhesion of my decals. The decal set and fix was brushed on the area where the decal was to go. The decals were soaked, this time for a bit longer because they were so old. And then put on some kitchen towel for the excess water to wick away. Any moment now. Once the decal was ready and the adhesive had started to dissolve, the markings were slid carefully into position. I used to squidge away any excess decal solution but I've recently learned that it's best to leave it underneath the decal. These yellow markings were from the main whippet. If you remember, I built that a few years ago, and these were close enough for operational Stuart markings. The bad news decal was again taken from a 148 Sherman, of the Hobby Boss variety. And the only decals I was really missing was the technical plate, you know, the little square with information on it, and USA markings for above the serial number. The serial number is a bit big, but again, I'm working with what I had, and these decals came from a 172 Dragon model landing craft. I wasn't too meticulous with lining them up, obviously they get better than here, because these were usually sprayed hand-applied stencils. Sadly, all that's missing is the USA above them. Just a touch more tweaking, and these will be perfect. Once the decals were dry and in position correctly, they were given a layer of VMS decal softener. This will help the decals bed down into any details on the model. And considering they're all quite old, they needed a few applications to conform correctly. On the reference pictures of Stuarts I've seen in the European theater, as I know I didn't mention, but this is set around D-Day, the circles around the stars were closed and not segmented, so I just used some white Vallejo paint to close these up. Once that was done, the decals were all sealed in with some VMS matte varnish. And for this step, I did have some white stars, but they did disintegrate. 
but as a stylistic choice I decided to paint the stars on the side of the hull black. Using the original decal as a template, I laid over some R-Tool Ultramask vinyl masking sheets over the decals and then used a ruler and the decal as a guide to cut out some new stars. I then used some off-black MRP to spray these markings on. As this tank was fairly fresh from the factory, I went for a light weathering approach. I used some brown VMS chipper nick and sponge chip this over the entire model. Because the olive drab is fairly dark, it didn't stand out and gave me a nice subtle chipped appearance. A few dabs on the more exposed areas, and that was that. Right, it's time to start detail painting. First up, I treated the rubber areas to some AK 3rd gen smoke black. So pretty much all the tyres. Because there was so much definition on these 3D printed parts, painting the tyres was a breeze. The tracks were also sprayed with the same colour, just to block in the rubber areas. I didn't spray the entirety of the rubber tracks, some areas I had to paint, otherwise I would have got black paint on the return roller. So this step wasn't too tedious. The next bit was quite tedious. Each exposed metal section of the track had to be brush painted. For this I used a sandy grey as a base. Once each part had been painted, I sponge chipped some browns and greys on the metal areas to show some light corrosion and dirt. Next up it was time to glue the tracks and running gear into place. Spot the missing piece. Yes, I did break a guide horn, but this was easily fixed. First up, I glued the one-piece tracks, return rollers, and drive sprocket into place. There was enough flex and play in the tracks to then glue on the bogey wheels. A few drops of super glue and a little bit of positioning, and these went on great. My sausage fingers did slow down the process a little bit. Next up I started painting the stowage. For the tarps I used a AK 3rd gen US green and this was thinned with a touch of water. I've started to use a few more AK 3rd gen acrylic colours in my lineup. I think they're a little thinner from the get-go than Vallejo model colour. And if you're interested I'm using a size 0 Artis Opus Series S Kalinsky Sable. Next up I painted the wooden boxes with Vallejo's old wood. I'll be going over these later with some oils. Eagle-eyed viewers will have noticed that one of the crates contains loads of apples. And oddly, these apples are one of the things I was looking forward to painting the most. I based them in hull red before adding some highlights with white. And remember, these apples are 148 scale, so they're really tiny. I then started to glaze in some bright reds over the apples. I used a mix of Vallejo colours and Artist acrylic inks. I did add a few green areas to some of the apples, but I did that off camera. But I then added some more highlights with a pinky red mix. I used some red, some white and a touch of yellow to maintain the vibrancy. I then added some more shadows with a dark purpley brown. Well, I think they look good enough to eat. I wouldn't recommend it though. Next up, the tools were painted in a mix of black and brown. Just a kind of dark, steely colour, you know? It was then time to paint the track cleats on the side of the turret. These were painted in a mix of blacks and greys. Ranging from a dark, dirty tan to a smoky black. Some browns were added to the mix to give them a corroded look. I added some oils to the wood sections on the tools and the crates. I used a mix of burnt sienna and burnt umber artist oils. These were thinned and then brushed in place. And after about 20 minutes when the thinner had evaporated, I used a stiff brush to impart a wood grain texture. 
Don't forget I do have a tutorial video on how to do wood grain with oils. What's next for this little Stuart? Well it's time for some dust effects. The entire model was given a layer of VMS chipping medium 3k. I really like the combination of regular pigmenty dust over a chipped airbrush dust, so that's why I'm doing this step. Once the chipping medium had dried, it was time to tactically apply some dusty coloured paint. I don't remember exactly what shade I used for the dust, but it was along the lines of a dunkel gelb, or German dark yellow. This was built up in areas where I'd expect the dust to accumulate, around cracks and crevices and fiddly areas like the areas between the two driver hatches. I also did some streaky dust effects on the side of the hull just by using little vertical flicks of the airbrush to add a streaky look. Once this was done, I used some warm water and an old tutty brush to wear away some of that dust. After a little bit of perseverance, the dust started to chip nicely. Although I haven't mastered this technique yet, I do think it looks really effective. On the sides of the hull, I made sure to focus on areas that might get touched or abraded quicker, like the corner just to the right of the bad news vehicle. It's quite a prominent angle, and I expect the dust would be worn away quicker there. Again, I use the same logic for the fenders, wearing away in particular any areas that might get touched or have traffic. For my washes, I used some oil paints. First up, I mixed a dark green. I mixed up some Abtalung 502, Field Grey, and Starship Filth. This gave me like an ultra dark olive drab color, which I could use to bring out some of the shadows around the crevices of the model. It's a fairly simple step, but it adds some nice contrast. The washes were all thinned heavily with VMS Universal Weathering Carrier Light. Next up, I used some Abtalung 502 Oxide Patina. This was brushed onto more exposed metal items like the track cleats and the tools. And for the final step on the Stuart, it was time to add some more realistic dust effects. For these I used AK Dust and Dirt Deposits, a mix of light dust and brown earth. This was again thinned with VMS UWC and brushed around all the crevices over the top of the sprayed dust chipping effect. This stuff likes to stain so it's best to work quickly. Apply your dust effect, and then pretty soon after, blend it in with a soft brush. The process was again repeated on the sides of the hull. A quick note, all these effects are also used on the running gear too. So don't worry, I didn't forget that. For the sides of the hull I wanted a more streaky appearance, so again this was brushed on roughly and then blended in, this time with vertical streaks with a soft brush. And for the ultra final touch, I used some Mr. Hobby buffable dark iron on the machine guns. This was just brushed lightly on and then dry brushed to a light sheen. And with the Stuart done, it's time to move on. And what's next? Painting the figures. Because I've done a lot of figure videos lately, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I will still show you my process. First up, these 3D printed figures were primed with Mr. Surfacer 1500 Black. I still can't get over how detailed these figures came out in 148 scale. For the majority of the painting, I'm going to be using the AK 3rd Gen World War II US Army set. All the sets had sold out at the time of buying them, but I was able to buy the colours individually and make up the set that way. And the cool thing is, they cost exactly the same. Which is a bit odd though, because you'd expect when you're buying a set to have a little bit of a bulk discount, but anyway, I digress. The base of the flesh was picked out with AK 3rd Gen Red Brown and Vallejo model colour Cork Brown. The helmets were picked out with AK 3rd Gen Dark Olive Green. 
before adding some highlights to the flesh with sunny skin tone. For progressive highlights I added in some Vallejo light flesh. But this was built up in a sketchy manner at first, refining the layers as I went on through the flesh tones. As per usual, this looks messy right up until almost the final step. Shadows were reinforced with some red brown, flat flesh and a touch of hull red. You don't often see figures painted with disruptive camouflage on the face, so that was something I really wanted to try. I used some Absalom 502 Field Grey, and I brushed this on really carefully with an absolutely tiny brush. I used oil paints because I knew I'd mess up, and I did several times, but I was able to remove it. But once I was happy and it was dry, it was sealed in with some matte varnish. These two figures took a little while to do, mainly because I wasn't too familiar with the camo colours. So I painted this one up first as a test, before getting stuck into the second guy, the fellow with the Thompson. Initially I was going to paint him tan, but there was different evidence on what colour the uniform was supposed to be. So the second figure was based with AK 3rd gen US Olive Base. For shading I started with the highlights. I added a few touches of grey green to the olive green base. This lightened green was built up on areas that I thought would catch the light. I built up a few subtle highlight layers until I was happy, increasing the ratio of grey green to my olive green. To maintain the warmth of the green, for the extreme highlights I added in some small touches of flesh tone, just to stop the highlights getting too chalky. I mixed up some dark olive green with some red brown and used this to paint the high wear knee and elbow patches on the uniform. Elements of the webbing was also picked out with some tans, browns and greens. And the boots were based with AK 3rd gen red brown. All the shadows and highlights were built up in a similar way, using darker and lightened versions of the base colours. On this pockety thing, I started with a base of US Field Drab. I proceeded to add some highlights with a sandy brown Vallejo colour. Mixed of course with a little bit of the base colour to promote unity between the two colours. And these highlight layers were built up carefully. For the extreme highlights, I started introducing some Vallejo German Camouflage Beige. And once the highlights were complete, it was time to reinforce those shadows again. I mixed in some German C Black Brown Vallejo colour into the AK 3rd Gen US Field Drab. The shadows were highly thinned and built up in a glaze like manner. This way, I can vary the intensity and depth of the shadows just by using more layers. The Thompson was painted black and the wooden areas were painted with Vallejo Old Wood. I then used some Burnt Sienna and Burnt Umber Artist Oils to add some wood grain. And that's the figures done. Let's build the diorama. First up I started with a deep edge picture frame. I think this is around 15 by 15 centimeters. I glued the back plate in place to make sure it was stable and the base is ready for some clay. I'm using Daz Air Dry Clay Terracotta Colour. The colour does not matter. To promote adhesion from the clay to the base, I dabbed on some Gorilla Wood Glue, which is just a PVA glue basically. First up, I needed to make the base level by filling in the one centimetre gap in the centre of the frame. I spread around my Daz with an old palette knife and then started building up the texture for my diorama. My plan was to do a raised road slightly raised road, in the bocage, so a road with a hedgerow effectively. I would have loved to have done a dual hedgerow setup, but you wouldn't have been able to do the tank, so I'm kind of just going to suggest that the tank is in the bocage. Using my trusty palette knife, I sculpted out a road, the base of a hedgerow, and a gentle slope away from the road. I then used some metal wire to simulate the roots from the hedgerow. These were just poked into the clay whilst the clay was still wet. 
When working with this thickness of Daz clay, it'll take about three days to dry. So I've got plenty of working time. Next up, I mix some VMS pigment with VMS diorama textures and combine this with some plaster of Paris. This was then dolloped liberally over the base. This was dolloped and stippled to make a convincing earth texture. While the plaster was still drying, I sprinkled over some more VMS diorama texture. I used brown earth and pebbles and fine grey earth. I made sure to build up lots of texture and added some boulders to the edge of the hedgerow. Sorry, the footage isn't great for this bit. Next up, I used some VMS Smart Mud for the road. I use this because it's soft and malleable and has a nice texture. I did have trouble, however, getting it to stick to the road. I eventually had a big brain moment and mixed some water in with the paste, and after that it stuck down really well. I just had to be careful with my application not to get it on any of the areas I'd already done. Although I did plan to slightly widen the road towards the right hand side of the diorama base, just to give the tank a little more room. I blended the edges in by stippling it with an old brush, just so it didn't look spooned on. Then to emulate the kind of gravelly road you see in Normandy, I sprinkled on some fine sand and some fine grey earth. I think these three textures combined will look pretty good. It's not the right colour though, so I will have to paint it later. To fix this in place, I mix some PVA glue with some acrylic airbrush thinner and then sprayed it all over the base to make sure it locked everything in place. I made sure everything was absolutely soaked before I was happy. AK Real Colour 7027 makes another appearance now, but this time as the base colour for the gravel road. So I used this and several other tans and browns to bring out the road and add some depth and detail to the surface. And again another reoccurring colour, this time AK Real Colours Early War Panzer Dunkel Brown. This was used as the base colour for the earth areas. Looking at reference pictures and watching videos of explosions and earth and all that kind of thing, I've come to realise that earth and mud is actually a lot darker than we realise. Unless it's bone dry. So I went with this darker shade for the base colour for my muddy bits. Can I say that? Next up, being a man of eternal variety, I used some grass tufts from AK and other various manufacturers to add some grass to the base. I have realised that after several diorama videos of using the same grass products, I might need to mix it up a little bit more in future. But for now, I'm using what I've got. These were fixed in place with PVA glue. Talking of mixing things up, I bought these spring green shrubs and summer blooming shrubs from AK. These were to be used as my hedgerow. It was honestly the best looking product I could find for this. I am quite fussy, but it still isn't perfect. Anyway, I cut out some hedge shaped blobs from these like stringy pack things in preparation for gluing them onto the diorama base. Just a bit more chopping and I think I'll have something that looks about right. These bits of hedge were glued into pre-drilled holes with some PVA glue. I would have used super glue, but I wanted a bit of adjustment time. So PVA it was. Once I had something that looked a bit like this, it was time to paint the greenery. I used a mix of medium and bright greens to paint the grass. I think I used some olive colors mixed with some MRP zinc oxide primer, which is a yellow color and works quite well for highlighting greens. I then used some cooler greens to add some shadows to the hedgerow, more your kind of dark foresty colours. Although the hedge did look okay, I wanted to add some more depth. I bought some Model Scene 148 ferns especially for this project, as these hedgerows did have ferns growing from underneath them, but I did test them first on this 1 16th Witch King of Angmar bust that I painted up over a few days for Sophie's sister. 
and they did come out pretty good so I decided to commit them to the diorama. They were carefully cut from their paper backing sheet before being super glued to the model. I think they look pretty good but they will need a lick of paint. Next up it was time to paint some of the details on the base. I used a mix of Vallejo and AK third gen colours to pick out the rocks just to add a bit of life. The ferns were painted in various bright greens and the base of the hedgerow was given a really dark oil wash. I then rounded off the natural look of the base by using some AK moss deposits on the underside of the hedgerow and on some of the rocks. I dabbed this on and then blended it in with a soft brush. Hopefully this gives you a good impression of the moist vibrancy you see underneath a hedgerow. And all that was left was to put the figures and the tank on the base. I did plan to add a few more details to the base, but because it was quite compact, I decided not to. Sometimes simple is best. And with that, my 3D printed Normandy 44 101st Airborne Stuart Diorama, man that was a mouthful, was complete. I'd like to give a huge thanks to my patrons for supporting my work. I appreciate your generous support. Anyway, what do you guys think of this diorama? I was really impressed with the quality of the files that I 3D printed. They came out great. I'm pretty happy with the paint job. Of course, there are always areas where I can improve, but I am quite self-critical. I found painting the figures to a reasonable standard in 148 scale was quite tricky, but I am happy with the result. Overall, I think it came together nicely, but please do let me know what you think in the comments. And if you like this diorama, don't forget to press the like button. It does help me out. Anyway, I'm going to leave you with the gallery images for you to enjoy, and I best get to work on the next video. So that's me, James, from LPJ Models. Thanks for watching.